Bitcoin is ethical, but it's also peaceful. It's not a currency that worships violence. From a political standpoint, you have politicians on both sides, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter, that are aggressively trying to vote resources, financial resources, into their local jurisdictions in order to support this war machine that's happening. And that's the game of fiat currency where nobody is pegged in operating off the same rules, and the same rule set, which is supplied by Bitcoin. It supplies this global rule set that nobody can manipulate, cheat, or take advantage of over the expense of other players in the global game. And that's why Bitcoin's so different. And that's why Bitcoin solves this, this massive problem that has been wrought throughout history between humanity and violence. Fiat money is used to fund wars. We've spent $8 trillion on regime change wars over the past 20 years. And almost and all those wars made America less safe and less secure and less rich. There was almost no debate about those wars uh, beforehand. What do we get for those wars? Iraq is now worse off than we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We killed between 670,000 and a million Iraqis. Iraq is now this, in, instead of a nation, it's an incoherent battle between Shia and Sunni death squads. We created ISIS in the spillover war into Syria and we drove two million refugees into Europe and we destabilized every democracy in Europe. That process ended up with Brexit, with breaking up the European Union. The riots that we're now seeing in France are a direct result of that surge of immigration that was driven by our wars. So the taxpayer would never agree to fund those wars in advance. And the government doesn't want it, politicians don't want to go to the taxpayer and ask that permission. So it's much easier for them to just declare the wars and then finance them by printing more money. But ultimately, the people who pay for that money are the middle class, and they pay through the mechanism of inflation. So when the governments print money, it has the ability to fund the military industrial complex and create tremendous reckless spending. So when you look at wars throughout history, that's a very, very profitable thing. And central banks can print money to fund both sides of the war. As a person who was flying attack helicopters in combat, there was almost every single flight I went on, somebody that was being shot at, injured, killed. Providing that support for people on the ground was uh, an extremely humbling experience to just see how destructive human beings can be towards each other. When you go far enough upstream as to what's driving this behavior, why, why is this even happening? I personally arrived that it's the money that's causing this to happen. And there's probably nothing more important for me in, in my life than trying to make sure people can understand that there's, there's a better way to conduct exchange. And there's a better way to get along with each other than to have a trusted ledger that nobody can manipulate or change. We need to make war and fear less profitable. That's the real layer two solution that we need on top of Bitcoin. It's us, not code on a blockchain, but a human society that makes nonviolence and kindness more profitable than exploitation and greed. Okay, I'll just comment on that a bit because um, I mentioned in the previous reactions that there are mainly three causes of war and division in the world. So mainly um, ideologies, religion, and money. And here we can see how they um, show us that if the system of uh, great money creation is wrong then that will bring about wars conflict violence basically division in the world so hopefully bitcoin will change this 
and hopefully people all around the world will will see this uh, become a reality very soon okay I cannot wait why is nobody in the in the u.s concerned that we've been in these wars for as long as we have why isn't anybody asking about the cost of this just not even human life but like the financial cost and the reason why is because it was always paid through debasement they didn't know they were paying for it because the bill was pushed way out into the future through the depreciation of the currency itself and so it just didn't seem like there was a cost and so it's not just the U.S. that pays for their armed conflicts this way. It's every fiat-based nation state that pays for their armed conflict this way. If you move to a Bitcoin standard, all of a sudden, you can't debase <laughs> the cost of conflict away. And Bitcoin, you know, conversely, is the currency of peace. If you actually have to go to a population and ask permission to wage war, in most cases, they're not going to give you that, that permission. You know, it's interesting when a government gets into trouble and they have to pay for a war or they have to pay for a pandemic or they have to pay for some cataclysmic event, they tend to print money. And because you're going to have these governments printing all this money, then the money is worth less. Well, what if it were all Bitcoin? Not only would that government not have the ability to print the money for the war, you might not even have the war. Mm. So many people see a world where Bitcoin reduces war, makes it unaffordable, and incentivizes us all to love and serve one another. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I believe that Bitcoin is just money and in in the Bible, there are many examples of what just money is and what unjust money is. Without a doubt, government fiat currency is not just money. It, it steals from the poor and gives it to the rich. It creates more income inequality. I think God hates the current system that government fiat creates. That elite group of people. So in a way, Bitcoin is the savior. <laughs> Aside from the Christians believe on Jesus Christ as the savior of the world, then probably there is uh, another savior that can solve a lot of our current problems and will bring about global peace. So, Bitcoin? Mm hmm, interesting, eh? That elite group of people makes decisions based on their own portfolios, based on their own set of priorities or those of their friends and colleagues who mean a lot to them. They're not really making up more money. They're just taking it very often through inflationary policies from those who have earned it. It becomes a system of great injustice and even theft. Uh, the United mm. States government has been printing money like crazy. It's, it's the dream solution. Uh, it's, it's a way of stealing money without being caught. And, uh, you know, spending other people's money is fun. That's all there is to it. It's one of the best reasons to go into politics. You get to spend other people's money. And most voters are not aware that as prices go up, reflecting profound inflation, that this is the doings of an immoral government that uh, is literally stealing the bread off your table. Wow. Those are really strong words. <laughs> it's our government stealing our own money without us knowing it. <laughs> so inflation is theft. It steals from us right under our noses. And sadly, the way people keep up with inflation is to max out their credit cards and take on more and more debt, which only creates bigger problems. Interest is the invention of Satan. We have interest levels today in our time that far outrun inflation oftentimes. And I think that does raise some ethical questions for us about, about how we handle our money in the modern world and how we charge people who pursue credit, that kind of thing, because they end up paying a, a lot just to make up the credit aspect of what they've done as opposed to the money that they've been provided for in a loan. 
So in Islam, uh, the practice of lending at interest is forbidden. And specifically, the word that is used is riba. Riba literally riba. means surplus or excess. And it means any excess on money. So any form of money creation is forbidden. Uh, riba is interest, it's usury, it's money creation. So um, when we talk about sound money in Islam, we're really talking about a form of money that cannot be created from nothing and therefore requires proof of work. Now, one of the problems with fiat money is that it doesn't require proof of work. Well, that's interesting. Let's see what other religions have to say about Bitcoin and its ethics. Okay, so I have some Muslim friends who, yeah, they have, uh, told me and confirmed that their religion doesn't allow them to take on debts and even house loans. So I have friends in Australia, in Perth, in Sydney, who would rather be renting than take out loans, uh, house loans, because um, that is not allowed in their religion. So that's very interesting. Many people question, what is the role of technology in Judaism? This is a tradition and a law which goes back thousands of years. So what could it possibly have to say about these modern inventions and technologies? The fact is that everything that God creates in this world is all for the purpose of making the world a better place and serving him better. So all of these technologies, whether it's phone, internet, video, all of these things, Bitcoin can be used and should be used for the better service of God. India was this fabulously wealthy industrial power and a spiritual innovator at the same time. And it's largely because its economics had somewhere in its foundation the idea that the ultimate goal is the pursuit of moksha, this true freedom. And we can get back to that. So if Bitcoin helps us to get back to a new kind of capitalism that fosters both material well-being and spiritual freedom, It'll be great, but that kind of new capitalism won't really be that new. It's more like a return to our old habits. Mm. So it sounds like Bitcoin can bring out the best in us. Let's explore these religious teachings more deeply. When it comes to Judaism being compared to a blockchain, there are so many points that we can look at. Besides the word chain itself, the transmission of Torah and Judaism through the generations is called histauchalut, a chain of descent from rabbi to rabbi and generation to generation. So what every individual can do is study Torah. They become their own full node. They can validate all of the laws and all of the customs and traditions. And then as new situations arise, rabbis have to deal with how does the Torah have a perspective on these new technologies, on these new questions? That's where proof of work comes in. The rabbis are the most educated and experienced in analyzing and studying the Torah. So they prove their work through their study and through their writings, which can then be verified by every member of the tribe. All they have to do is look into the Torah and validate that what the rabbis are saying fits in with the Torah values and Torah teachings. Particularly as a Jewish person who the Jewish people have been dispersed across the entire world and have had to move from country to country, I can appreciate a money that you can take with you and own and use for your purposes without it being interfered by third parties. Bitcoin is just another step in the technological development of how we can serve God better. So remember uh, the diaspora? Buddhism itself is a decentralized system. In fact, it's the only faith that I know of where the founder himself said, don't trust anything I say on faith. You have to validate it yourself. So what validation in Buddhism means 
is that you have to critically analyze anything anything that the Buddha himself said. So in a way, as a Buddhist, you're a kind of block validator <laughs> where you yourself have to relive the Buddhist algorithm. Buddhism is really like an algorithm, a set of a set of rules that the Buddha said, if you follow these, you will be happy and you will create a, a kind, benevolent and fair society. And so that I find very parallel to the way that blockchain works because you know, wanted to create a system that benefits all beings, you know, and not just some select subset. Those things I think are very aligned with this idea of decentralization. So yeah, I think Buddhism is a decentralized religion. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Buddhism is decentralized. So you have to validate yourself what is truth and what is not. So what is uh, what works for you and what doesn't. So wow, very interesting Buddhism. <laughs> If you have centralized planning, that is, fewer people who um, are making the decisions about the, the economy as a whole, you have less information. If you have a decentralized economy, what you have are more people, more inputs, more kind of connection to the reality of what's happening than you would have if you have a small Politburo a group of policy advisors who are making these decisions very often influenced by their own particular interests. So when we ask what the Bible says about money, the, the key thing is that money itself is not evil. Sometimes you hear people say money is evil. It's not. It's, it's a means by which we manage our relationships and barter with one another with different skills and abilities that we have. What the Bible says is, is the love of money that is evil, that it is when it moves us towards greed, when it moves us towards covetousness, when it moves us towards avarice, when it feeds our pride, those kinds of things. That's when money becomes a problem. And actually, it isn't money that's the problem, it's how we deal with money that is the problem. Yeah, I would like to comment on that because um, there are some extreme views about Poverty, even within Christianity, so there are different, um, um, like sects or like, um, how do you call them? Um, different subgroups within Christianity. So, so money is not the root of evil. It's the love of money that is the root of evil. So, just like any instrument or any tool, money is just a tool. So it's up to the human being who uses the tool to use it properly or improperly to use it uh, to promote goodness and kindness and prosperity or to feed your own greed okay so um, and inequality so yeah it, it, it's really up to the person how to uh, use that tool that, that instrument so i would rather have a lot of money as a christian okay because in that sense i could probably help a lot more people uh, give them employment give them opportunities um you know s uh, contribute to their education so I would say I would rather be really rich because I can help more people. If I don't have anything, I won't be able to help more people. So to be rich is good. It is not evil. It is up to you how you use that resources, that money. So money is not the root of evil. It's the love and uh, greed and you know the love for money um in itself you know um and use it in i don't know to to foster inequality or just to satisfy your greed and um hedonist hedonistic desires then probably that's the the reason why it can become evil but yeah Let's be rich and help a lot of people. 
I would support that. I love that idea. Let's see what Hinduism says. Now, in Vedic economics in ancient times, the ruler, who was often elected, by the way, even 2,000, 3,000 years ago, was judged on a concept called yoga kshema, which means an overall material and spiritual well-being of the citizens, particularly the weakest in society. Monetary profit was considered just a byproduct. So fiddling with the money supply, though it might do some temporary good, means that we are ignoring a lot of the key metrics of what makes life worth living. One reason we print this money is to get people to go out and shop with it or to take on debt at low interest rates so they can go out and shop with that. Now, I don't know of any religion or philosophy that says that the goal of human life is to consume to the point of debt. So in a real sense, we are incentivizing something that goes against our basic morality. And I'm not sure how long we can continue to do that. The truth is, what we really are is divine beings who have taken human form in a material world that we manifest together for a meaningful purpose, to be happy and free. That's the truth. And that's the foundation of Vedic economics. And Bitcoin has a chance to help us to see ourselves that way. I just would like to um, comment on our current um, economic system of debt creation and promoting debt, promoting borrowing and lending and all this kind of stuff. So if you go to the malls, the first thing at the entrance of the mall, what do you usually see? Usually there are car sellers and the second people who would type of people who would approach you are credit card companies no so they're they're here um telling people that hey you can apply for a credit card and take a loan so this is the kind of uh, uh mentality that we are used to at the moment so and we are being encouraged to take on more loans to take on more debt so we are in carriage okay so you can see a lot of ads uh, credit card companies promoting you know um i don't know low interest rates and so so this is the kind of um economic system that we live that we live in at the moment and the kids also see that because they can see that in the on tv on on the internet, in the malls, printed everywhere on the streets, no? Inter low interest rates, take a loan, apply for a credit card, apply for a house loan, apply for this, apply for that. So, yeah, it's a money we don't have, we don't own yet. We don't have. So, it, I don't know how that becomes ethical. So, I, yeah. I don't like it. Uh, I myself, I don't have debts, to be honest. Um, I, I, uh, I don't have debts. So I sold my house because I realized that, oh my God, I'll be 75 year old and I will still be working just to pay off this effing house because it costs a lot. And by that time, I would pay it off in over 20 years i would have paid the bank three times of its original price so it's ridiculous it's the bank who makes money not me i'm just spending my energy working wonder working 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 until i'm spent up to my last drop of blood okay so i hated the idea so i sold my house and um yeah i started living more uh, a simpler life um paying buying a block of uh, sm a small block of land but i paid it in cash okay so i would rather be saving for that money for that big purchase that you are planning and then pay for it in cash rather than take it taking out a huge loan 
and you will have a great burden of how will you pay that over time plus the interest so it it will suck the life out of you okay so i i hate the idea of um debt i hate it there are sources of scripture in islam which are the quran which is believed to be the word of god and the hadith which are the collection of the sayings and actions of prophet muhammad peace be upon him and there are two very famous hadith one regarding price fixing and the other regarding monopolies uh, the price fixing hadith goes something like the following a group of people came to the prophet and said to him would you fix the prices of commodities in the marketplace and he considered this and he said no because he didn't want to cause an injustice against the people he said that god is the one who fixes the price uh, in the market so this thing i think is very important because it tells us that a, a free market economy is one that is fundamentally a just economy i think bitcoin is the most islamic form of money ever invented and therefore you know also the most abrahamic form of money invented because actually the the three great monotheistic faiths share many characteristics in terms of justice and equality and fairness and dealing with one's fellow man so i think that bitcoin has those characteristics to be not just the most islamic form of money but the most jewish and the most christian form of money as well uh, and i think therefore it is a, it's a very very powerful concept and one which can completely overturn our understanding of the last 100 years of economic history in a bitcoin world so so there we are we get to see the uh, the best parts of every religion so from christianity's point of view islam buddhism hinduism so so we can see that they all have some very nice concepts about money so uh which sort of complement each other so all these religi religions will probably unite and agree that yeah it's bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> so bitcoin will unite us and not divide us okay uh, as religions so very interesting uh, presentation world people would work together and be free and happy if fixing our money could help us achieve that imagine the kind of future we could build i like to kind of think about how the story of bitcoin is still being written the story, the chapter one started over a decade ago, and here we are, and we have no idea what kind of the final chapter of the book ultimately looks like. If you think about Bitcoin taking over the world, right, the Bitcoinization of, of the world, and you play that out to its last element, what could that last stage be from a potential perspective? And that is a world in which there is no other currency. All of the governments have dropped the dollar and the yen and the euros, and all there is in the world is Bitcoin. And it is the standard kind of payments mechanism for, for anything. A few steps before that is going to be central banks around the world adopting Bitcoin as a reserve currency. I'd actually expect that to happen. At the same time, when I started in this space, I thought this might take out centuries. And every single year, I feel like my time frame gets shorter and shorter and shorter. I think if the world went on a Bitcoin standard, I think what we'd see would be less wars. We'd see government size drastically reduced because the ability to tax your citizens becomes much harder. So if Bitcoin is successful and the world starts to use it, we see the role of government start to shrink quite a bit. And their ability to extract value from their citizens and their ability to wage wars also drop too. Yeah. And a optimistic government should look at Bitcoin and understand that this is a, a movement that's not going to stop. You can't really ban it, and if you do, it doesn't mean no, every no other country can will ban either. It now. So it's better to get on the train, see this coming, versus try to fight it and try to fight against it. It's sort of like a inevitable sort of change. The things that are happening now are things that we were only dreaming of when we were, you know, on our PCs in computer class in 1985. <laughs> This is not just an advancement in technology or an advancement in computing or an advancement of a monetary system. In my opinion, Bitcoin represents an evolution of consciousness beyond anything we've seen in thousands of years. 
we are moving towards a digital future, and we are moving towards a future that's going to require a disintermediation between governments, banks, and centralized control. And Bitcoin grants us this power through an open network that anybody around the world can participate in. It's extremely powerful. And if people adopt it, in time, we will see how we'll put the power back in the individual's hands and disintermediate those at the top that are trying to control the human race. There isn't yet a Bitcoin tangible economy, but that may change. And in fact, I think on some level, it's already beginning to change. So it's obviously something that uh, I think everybody should watch with great interest. I think it would be a great mistake to ignore the Bitcoin economy. I'm excited for the future of Bitcoin because we're just really beginning to understand all of it and the uses for it and the advantages of it. In a Bitcoin operating world, it'll just be a completely shifted dynamic. So it will be more that people can save up and then invest into a certain business. And so in a short way of putting it, it's like saying we're going to live in a more equity based system as opposed to debt. Whereas right now it's all about cheap debt. Cheap credit is how the thing expands. Whereas in the future, it will be more equity and savings based. You know, I'm a person who yeah. really believes that everyone Maybe. should have the right to health care, to right to a home, uh, right to food uh, and so on. All the basics. Um, we should all have our share of the Earth's bounty and no political or financial system we've come up with has yet solved that problem for humanity, although we're getting a little bit closer. So the idea of putting it into collectively agreed algorithms that no individual can change is very, very powerful. So these things are happening all over the world. What I see in the next 10 years is that Bitcoin is flourishing. Bitcoin is solving problems for people in the places where they have the problems. That could be currency problems, that could be energy problems, that could be being able to escape from your country. And that growth is something we see every day. It's not shrinking, just like the internet just keeps growing, right? Lots of people ask, um, how long will it take for the world to be on a Bitcoin standard? Will there, will there ever be a time where Bitcoin is the world reserve asset and the world reserve really currency? Happen. I think that that's inevitable. I do think that's coming at some inevitable. point, but I think we're still kind of a long ways away from that. And so maybe five, 10 years from now, I think lots of the world's government fiat currencies are going to dissolve and that purchasing mm. power is going to be transferred into either the US dollar, possibly the Chinese yuan, and certainly Bitcoin. And the world will wow. be a more just, a more honest, uh, and just a better place to live. We consider a sound form of money as a fundamental change for our financial and monetary system, because that will put us back on an even keel. That'll actually put us closer to those values that were once espoused 2,000 years ago by the Abrahamic faiths. One of the other areas that I just really like about Bitcoin is this idea that I mentioned earlier where it's a very unifying technology for us considering where, just considering how divisive the whole country is, the whole world. But especially in the United States, we're at each other's throats and we don't agree on anything. But now all of a sudden, Bitcoin comes in and you have Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and libertarians because they agree on Bitcoin and they agree on Bitcoin because it reflects their values back at them. And they believe that it's the right path for us to move forward. So all of a sudden now you have this base layer unifying technology that can really start to help us have conversations. Because the worst thing that we can do is get into our echo chambers and not talk to the opposite side anymore. Now you have Bitcoin helping to unify these groups and put them in the same room and have conversations. And I think that's where progress can be made. Our money should Beautiful. reflect actual value creation and not be sort of given to us by a government that's just trying to manipulate the money supply to get us to shop when they want and go into debt when they want. As long as we're manipulated like that, we're not truly free. That's what we need as a change. And Bitcoin gives us a basis. It gives us a tool for creating that kind of society and that kind of economy. We're at a very transitional time in history. If you look back through the long lens of history, what we see is a repeating cycle of freedom, oppression, revolution, freedom, oppression, revolution, freedom, oppression, and it just goes <laughs> through all of history. Yeah. And I think we're cycle. at a point in history where that cycle could finally break. And I think it could break to one or the other side. And it's gonna happen in the next decade or two, 
and it's gonna be up to us to decide which way it breaks. And I think the cycle breaks and either one, it breaks to where through CBDCs and social credit score system like they have in China, I through indoctrination not. through schools and social media, they can indoctrinate us, they can censor us, they can lock us down, keep us isolated, and potentially prevent any revolution from ever happening again. The other option is that understanding that the source of all their power comes from the ability to print money. The money yeah. printer is their power. And if we can defeat the money printer, and they have no more ability to print endless amounts of money, then their entire system falls apart. And Bitcoin is that tool that allows us to beat the money printer, defeat their system, and if we move to a monetary system that nobody can control, that system never builds up again. We defeat the money printer, they never get the money printer going again, and we have a life with no revolution cycles of just pure freedom for humanity from there. Beautiful. I see that we do have a choice to make. I always lean into hope and the good in all of us. We should not steal. We should not wage war. We should have a form of money we can trust so we can build a world of prosperity and abundance for future generations to live together in peace and harmony. Bitcoin embodies that hope purity and truth wow by the truth and do not sell ah beautiful if you want to learn more about bitcoin visit godblessbitcoin.com oh my lord that's beautiful um yeah it's amazing um i had goosebumps <laughs> so thank you guys for spending time with me and this is uh the start of what hurry up bit is going to do so i'm going to react to all those beautiful films like this similar to this uh next i'm going to react to michael saylor's um speech uh, i think it was the um i can't remember now but anyway i will see you in the next video and i hope you enjoyed this and learn a lot and now we can start reflecting and hopefully um you know help in spreading uh, the adoption the global adoption of bitcoin as a currency and as a store of value because bitcoin is good bitcoin will do a lot of good things to the world and to humanity in particular thank you guys i'll see you in the next video bye for now